Thanks, uh, thanks everybody. It's very nice to uh, uh, very very nice to be here today. And I'd like to thank first of all the TEDx organisers who've been just fantastic. They're such lovely people. Uh, being a neuroscientist, I always thought it was a safe bet uh, because the human brain is one of the most complicated things that we know about in the universe. Uh, an adult human brain is composed of about 85,000 million neurons, uh, each making somewhere between 1,000 and uh, 10,000 connections or synapses with, uh, with its neighbours. So if the expectation that you'll be out of work is low. Plenty to do. There's plenty to do. Uh, uh, and so the, the, the challenge, of course, uh, is to explain, explain that incredibly complicated device that we all use. We all deploy it every single day for every single action. And the interesting thing, of course, is we deploy it all night as well. Your brain's never quiet. It's never asleep. But before we talk, uh, before we talk about uh, uh, human brains, I want to talk about society. There's something very, very interesting about society. We use language to communicate, we use written words, we use spoken words to communicate all the time. Uh, but the thing that lots of people don't realise is that only about 20, 25% of all the communication in which we engage is verbal. 75% of it is non-verbal. And that's what I'm interested in, the non-verbal cues. And so I'm going to give you uh, a challenge today, uh, at the end of my talk, uh, to rethink how you're communicating with the people around you. Now. Uh, Something very, very interesting happened in, in the world in uh, 2009. For the first time in history, more people lived in urban areas than in, uh, uh, than in the countryside, than in rural environments. So in uh, 1950, for example, 30% of the whole world's population lived in an urban environment. By 2050, that will be 70%. There's something very, very special about living in groups. There's something important for us. Edward Glazer has written a, a cranking book that I, do, I would recommend to you uh, called Triumph of the City. Uh, and he talks about the reasons that we find it important to be in groups, to live with people who are close to us. And he talks about things like uh, the ability to exchange ideas, the ability to communicate. That ability to communicate has, of course, led to innovation. It's led to all the things that we see around us. The technology that we're using today to stream this all around the world has come about because humans do exchange ideas and they exchange it in close proximity. And one of the things that, of course, uh, that, that of course has grown at an enormous rate is our ability to convey lots of information about ourselves. People are on Facebook all the time. But we do live streaming, so I'm, I'm speaking into a microphone that can go anywhere in the world. There's video being taken uh, of our event here today that's going all around the world. And yet, and yet, something interesting has gone on. Despite that level of connectivity, despite being able to communicate in three dimensions, both visually and auditory, uh, in the auditory domain, uh, people still want to get together. There's something more going on about our non-verbal communication than simply what we say and how we look. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. And one of the things Glazer has, uh, ha has noted, and I've heard this quoted many, many times, so I thought I'd investigate it, is that despite that growing interconnectivity, people are getting together even more than they ever were. So I thought, well, I, and I'm a scientist, right, so you've always got to test ideas. So I went away and I, I had a look at some data to see whether or not that's true. Uh, and I had a look first at the data for uh, an emerging industry. Uh, and you know, there are young people who can't believe that e email and the internet is an emerging industry, but of course it is. Uh, and what I found, uh, I looked at the data from the, one of the leading uh, internet providers or email providers around the world. Uh, and I found that um, in, uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, in the year 2000, they had about 67 million users. 12 years later, 2011, they had 360 million users. So there's been this massive growth in, in uh, written uh, uh, digital communication. Now, the thing that's really, really interesting is if you look at airline travel, and this is Glazer's point, you might be predicting that the need to travel has gone down because people are communicating more. There's more avenues for it. It's easier to do. But in fact, it's gone up. So I collected data from just one month from a leading airline, 
uh, a leading world airline. Uh, and I found that over the same period, the number of passengers that they carried in just one month in June grew from about 1.8 million to over 4 million in the same time. Now, of course, that's not the same scale of growth, but you've got to remember that the airline industry is nearly 100 years old. It's got a head start, but it's still, it's still capable of doubling the amount of, uh, the amount of traffic. So there's something about being in proximity with each other that's really, really important for humans. So what is it? What is it uh, about eyeballing, about being face-to-face -face with someone that is so important? What, what's the critical thing that's missing when we listen to audio and look at video? What don't we get? Uh, Glazer asked that question as well, uh, and so that's the answer that I'm going to endeavour to provide you with today. Now, to do that, uh, I, of course, need some props. Uh, so I brought along a brain. This is my brain. Uh, I use it all the time. Uh, and it's, in fact, a standard model brain. Everyone in this room, everyone who's watching this, uh, wherever they are around the world, uh, will have a brain that's like this. As I said, about 85,000 million neurons, up to 10 times as many other cells. There's blood vessels uh, and a whole lot of other stuff going on in there. Uh, and somewhere between 10 to the 14 and 10 to the 15 connections. And there's lots of ways of thinking about the human brain. Uh, the way that I'm going to ask you to think about it today is as a communication device. One of the purposes of your brain, in fact, you could make the argument that the sole purpose of your brain is to make sure you've got the best possible chance in any environment in which you might find yourself of making it to the next moment. So what your brain does is collect a lot of information from the world, interpret it, and give you a, a, a set of options or provides you with uh, the opportunity to react and, and behave. And of course, large tracts of our brain are given over to processing visual and auditory information. So as you look at, at a brain, so this is uh, the left hemisphere of a normal human brain, as I said, uh, and we can divide each hemisphere, so there's two, we can divide each hemisphere into four lobes. At the very back, you've got the occipital lobe. At the front, you've got the frontal lobes. And frontal lobes are unique to humans. Where we've got massively developed frontal lobes. The only species to have, have, have so. At the back of the frontal lobes, but ahead of the uh, occipital lobe, we have the parietal lobe. And of course, down around behind our ears, if you stick a knitting needle in your ear, you'll go through your temporal lobe. So we've got these four lobes, and they're all specialised for different things. So almost all of the occipital lobe at the very back of your head, if Simon plays, if we play Simon Says and you put your hands on the back of your head, uh, you put your hands straight over the back of your occipital lobe, almost all your occipital lobe is given over to visual processing. That's what that bit of brain does. It handles all the visual information that you get. Now, our eyes are incredibly effective, and we get way more visual information than we can handle. So you can think of the occipital lobe as a kind of visual information processor. You don't see the world as it is, you see an interpretation of it that's mediated by your experience and, and how your brain works. And that's why magicians work. That's why magicians are so good at their job. They know how to fool, uh, fool you visually. Your temporal lobe, of course, is given over to many things, but auditory processing. And auditory processing starts in the temporal lobe and works its way up through the parietal lobe into the frontal lobes before you can make a sound. Now, at the junction of the frontal lobes and the parietal lobes, you've got somatosensory cortex, the part of your brain that's given over to controlling your body. It gets the information in from your body, what's touching your skin, how you feel, if you've got a niche, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then uh, there's a few steps, and uh, you start to enact the action. So I've got a itchy arm, I scratch my arm. This is... This is all the stuff that you can see on the outside. If we actually look inside, we see something that I think is even more interesting. So I'll pull apart my brain. Uh, if I look inside a human brain, what I can see is a history of our evolution. So at the very heart of a, the, the human brain is a very, very primitive brain composed of our brain stem and spinal cord. And that's the part of our brain that does things like mediates your heartbeat, your pulse, your blood pressure and those sorts of things. Does very primitive sorts of auditory processing, a little bit of visual processing. And it still works. Built around that is what we call the midbrain, 
uh, which is a newer, evolu newer evolutionary step, and almost all our sensory information on the way from the sensory receptor from our eye or our ear goes through our midbrain before it goes into this nice, shiny, brand new neocortex. And then, of course, we've got the uh, neocortex or new brain, the, the part of our, the, the evolutionary step that's particularly mammalian uh, on the outside of that. Now, buried in here, in and around the midbrain, are some very, very interesting processes. There are memory processes in there. So our memories are contained by a set of neurons that function primarily in the temporal lobe, but in the middle of the temporal lobe. And surrounding that is, and, and the memory systems sit adjacent to our emotional brain, the parts of our limbic system, the parts of our brain that control, control how we feel. So you've got this very, very complicated information processor that's got a memory bank and moderates your emotional state. Now, there's a sense that we haven't talked about. We've talked about seeing and we've talked about touching and we've talked about hearing. We haven't talked about smell. Now, humans don't really think of themselves as olfactory creatures. Uh, dogs smell well, rats smell well. Turns out humans smell well as well. Uh, we're much, much better at it than, 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 than we think we are. So, for example, uh, humans have got about 40 million olfactory receptors, and we can discriminate between about 10,000 odours, probably more, but at the moment we know of about 10,000. Our olfactory sense is, un is unique because it doesn't go into our midbrain. It doesn't go into that kind of middle processing bit. It goes straight into our memory banks, and straight into, it goes straight into our memory system, and it goes straight into our emotional brain. And almost everyone's had the experience of smelling something at some stage that they haven't smelled for maybe for a decade or 10 year, 20 or 30 years. You know, your, your grand's perfume. Someone walks past with your grand's perfume, and immediately and unconsciously, it triggers for you, triggers for you a, a memory that you probably wouldn't have recalled any other way. Uh, so our olfactory sense is uh, a primitive sense and it's all about mediating our emotional state uh, and making sure that we remember things and probably evolve because it's important to remember things that are nice to eat. You can smell whether something's ripe or not uh, or something that maybe made us sick once, once or twice in the past. So we've got this uh, olfactory sense that's buried away in there and it turns out we use it for all sorts of nonverbal cues. So, for example, humans are very, very good at discriminating whether or not someone's related to us by our smell. Now, we don't do that consciously, we do it unconsciously, and there's been numbers of experiments about this. So, for example, if you collect T-shirts worn by a group of, uh, a group of women, uh, fathers will rate, and you don't tell uh, uh, a male observer who wore what T-shirt, Fathers will judge the T-shirt worn by his daughter as the least pleasant smell. <laughs> Interestingly, women, at the time of ovulation, actually become more acute smellers. And they prefer the smells of men at that time that are more distantly related from them. So the olfactory cues are all about signalling something very important for breeding as well. Don't want to breed with someone whose you know, immune system is very much like your own. And that's the cue. That's the cue. You, your immune system affects how you smell. Don't want to breed with someone with an immune system much like your own. You want to breed with someone more distantly related so the offspring are more, more robust. There are, there, there's many, many uh, examples like that. Uh, so, for example, each of us can smell the difference between the sweat of someone who's won a competition and the loser. So again, if you, get, so if you get people to play, for example, in a tennis competition, the sweat of the people who won the competition will smell better, will be a more positive smell than the sweat of people, uh, the person who didn't win the competition. The sweat of dominant men makes every other person, male and female, more alert. So when an alpha male walks in the room, everyone's flight and fight response gets up ticked. We do all that non-verbally. And there's a, there's a vast raft of these sorts of, these sorts of effects. 
if uh, I, I can give you um, one more example. If you take just one compound from male sweat, it can make the attractiveness of magazines change. How enjoyable you, may, you find a magazine. It can make a change. So, this is, uh, so there's an experiment where uh, observers got to judge how much they enjoyed three types of magazines. A neutral magazine, a gender non-specific one, National Geographic. A male-oriented magazine, uh, you know, something about men's health or something like that. And a female-oriented magazine. And they got to judge how enjoyable it was without any smells of, uh, without any male scent, if you like, uh, and with male scent. And when the male scent was added, the enjoyment quotient for the non-gender specific magazine went up, it became more enjoyable. The enjoyment quotient for the men's magazine went up, it became more enjoyable as well. But of course, and, and interestingly, the enjoyment quotient for the female magazine went down. Because girls aren't supposed to smell like boys, right? <laughs> that, that creates ambiguity. It becomes less pleasant because we're not sure what's going on. We're not sure what's going on. So this is the challenge. This is the challenge for the internet. This is the challenge for video conferencing. This is the challenge for massively online open courses. Any university, any institution that wants to hold meetings online any, or teach online, how do you communicate those non-verbal, non-visual, non-auditory cues? How do you do it? It's impossible. It, it seems to us impossible for example, that you'd be able to capture uh, the sweat from someone that you're talking to on the other side of the planet and shift it. So we're going to have to do that some other way. When you lie, your, the smell, your, when you lie, your smell changes. When you're nervous, your smell changes, believe me. Right? <laughs> so the challenge, the challenge that, uh, you know, the big idea for today, or my big idea for the day, which probably isn't in the scheme of the big ideas around here, uh, my big idea for the day is how do we capture those olfactory cues? What is it that we have to give the receiver on the other end of the internet cable, on the other end of the fiber optic cable or the copper cable that goes from the corner to your house or whatever it is? How do you co convey that information so that virtual reality takes the step from being virtual to reality? Thank you. <laughs>